by faith because you don't feel anything. Yes. But he's promised that to wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, he'd be right there in the midst of that. Yes. So my encouragement to you today, my encouragement to you today that you just reach out to him. He's yes. here. Yes. And he wants to touch your life. He wants to fill you. He wants to hear your heart cry, answer your prayer requests. Give reassurance of faith. Heal your body. Meet your every, meet your every need. Amen. I heard this preacher yesterday and he was talking about how he read through the Gospels and there's over 70 accounts of, of God, of Jesus healing people. And he said that not one time did Jesus ever say no. He always said yes. Now, now obviously, we don't understand all of God's ways because God's ways are higher than our ways. So, you know, I've been healed sometimes. Sometimes I haven't been healed. Maybe it's a lack of faith. Maybe this wasn't God's timing. Maybe it wasn't His will. But He's always willing to give us what we have need of. Sometimes, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's working your way through a trial and a test. Because I can look back on some difficulties I've had in my life and I've become better because of having gone through them. Now, at the time, it wasn't very pleasant. It wasn't very fun. But I can look back and say, God, you helped me in that trying time. Yes, right. So, Father, for that, that person, maybe there's several persons here today that are going through a particularly challenging time, a difficult time in their life, whether it be physical, financial, relational. It doesn't matter what area of life because you're the Lord of all. We pray that you would move alongside them today by your Holy Spirit that we've been singing about today. Fill us, reassure us, give us strength, cause us to have an increasing faith to believe you for more, for that provision that you have for each one of us today. We trust you for that ministry of your grace and power to each one of us today. We're anticipating that you're going to anoint the Word of God and you're going to strengthen us and challenge us and help us to become more like your son, Jesus. And that's in whose name we pray today. Amen. And everybody, God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, as long as you're here, you may as well say hello to each other. Why don't you move out of the road that you're in? If you have God's tithe and offering the to bring, bring it forward in these buckets. And say hello to one another. Come on, let's move around and greet each other today.
Thank you for saying hello to each other, making each other feel at home here today. Thank you for your giving. God bless you for your faithfulness. How many had a wonderful Thanksgiving? Yeah, you did. I ate so much turkey, I feel like one. He's calling me Pastor Butterball today. You know, uh, we left here in a rush last Sunday to get catch our flight. Did you make it? Huh? We made it on time, but they canceled our flight. So we got to the airport, they canceled our flight, so we had to turn around and go home. Get on the computer, try to find another flight. And fortunately, we found a flight the next day for twice as much money, of course. But we got there and had a great time with our two of our daughters and their husbands and eight of the grandkids. We had a great time. I hope you had a wonderful time, too. So, no trip to fame. Sleepers here today in, in the auditorium. You have to stay awake. So if you have those turkey enzymes working on you, poke a neighbor or two and help each other stay awake. I hope uh, that the Word of God is interesting enough to keep you awake today. Uh, you probably see behind me uh, the title of today's message and probably recognize the picture. The picture is of five loaves and two fishes. How many are familiar with that story in the Bible? Yeah. It's a story that's found in all four of the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One of them, the only stories that's found in all four of the Gospels, as these four disciples tell of stories that they experienced in living life with Jesus. And Jesus performed a number of miracles. His very first recorded miracle in the Gospels of course, when he turned the water to wine, remember they were running out of wine at the marriage? And uh, so they brought pots in, and he was able to, after they filled them with water, to turn the water into wine. But so many incredible miracles, and uh, I've often wondered, well, how does a miracle work? How many of you ever wondered, how does a miracle work? So we're going to look at that theme today, but before we jump into that, a couple of commercials. Uh, ladies. Christmas dinner. I'm feeding back just a tiny bit. Blue on number one, bring it down just a touch. Uh, Thursday. This Thursday? No. No. 14th. No. December 14th. Glasses on. December the 14th, right? Yes. 6.30 p.m. And there's more information to follow. You'll find out how you can participate with that, ladies. I hope you make a plan. And we want to make it festive in here, too, now that uh, Thanksgiving is over with. Thanks for moving. I was tired of looking at that post, Pastor Sam and Rachel. Good to see you here today. God bless you. So we're going to decorate the church, Christmas church decorating on Thursday the 30th. That this Thursday at 6.30. So we'll have the tree here and all the decor and you can help put that together so we can enjoy that festive season. So let's jump right into our story again, the story of the loaves and the fishes. So before we do that, we want to play a little game since it's, you know, holiday season. You've got to play games. I heard of someone, I think it was Carol's telling us about a game their family played. I've not seen it. And, and I'm not a twerker. <laughs> but I guess they have this belt with a little bucket on the back and they put a ball in it. And you're supposed to bounce your booty, I guess. <laughs> See if you can bounce the ball <laughs> out of the back end of that little box. I would like to see the videos, maybe. <laughs> uh, we played Corco, we played cribbage, all kinds. Of, that, that's what family time's for, is having yeah, a good time. Yes. Huh? We did a couple of jigsaw puzzles. You like jigsaw puzzles? Anyway, maybe you play the game when you're a kid called, uh, I don't know what the name of the game is, but it's hot and cold. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, you're coaching each other. If you're getting close to an object, you say, hot. Hot. And if you're getting further and further away from it, you... Okay, so we're going to play the game. you got to help me out, all right? Because I'm trying to find my iPad so that I can get to the notes for the message today. So you got to coach me. Oh, oh. All right. You're not oh, there. Right. You're freezing. Cold. What in the world does that have to do with this 
Jesus is just great. Well, Jesus is gathered on the hillside and he's teaching his followers. There's a bunch of them gathered there. The story tells us that there were 5,000 men. So that's a pretty good sized crowd, yeah? And that means there's probably 5,000 women and then there were children. So quite a crowd, maybe 20,000 or more, maybe 30,000 people gathered on the hillside to hear Jesus teach and what a teacher he was. And gathered along with all the other people was a little guy. Let's call him Jimmy. Jimmy was there on the hillside and he brought his best friend Johnny with him to the hillside. So kind of have those two boys' pictures in your mind because they're all coming to hear Jesus teach. And Jimmy brought with him that day uh, a lunch with him. And it had in it uh, loaves of bread and fish. And uh, he had enough for his lunch. He was able to plan ahead or maybe his mom did. But he had no idea that day when he went there to the hillside to hear Jesus teach how God might use him in the miracle to provide that resource that was needed for all who were gathered there on the hillside to listen. He had no idea as he was traveling along with the crowd. They passed by the lake on their way to the mountainside going to where Jesus was. Had no idea how God was going to take his gift, his offering to bless so many other people. We receive offerings here, but it's more than just the money we give. It's the little things that we do for one another that God can take and use it to be a blessing to other people. How many want to be a blessing to someone else? Yeah. I often say, you've been blessed to be a blessing, right? And we all have something to offer, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's kindness. We have something to offer, and God wants to take what you have and multiply it out. If Jimmy could have heard an audible voice that day from God, uh, he would, would be able to hear God say, Jimmy, you're getting hot. You're getting hotter. You don't know how close you are to a miracle. You're getting closer to a miracle than you even have the capability of understanding how you're going to be used of God. You don't realize today what's about ready to happen. You have no idea to know how I'm going to use you to do something that's going to be a blessing to literally thousands and thousands of people. In fact, your story will be told for generations and centuries to come. Here we are, the end of 2023, and we're still talking about little Jimmy and his lunch. This is an important occasion. Hey, Jimmy, you're hot. You're close. You're about ready to be used by God in a miracle. So we're here today. We've been enjoying each other's company, the fellowship of God's people and friendship and kindness. And some of you picked up a few pastries that you didn't need out in the lobby. <clears throat> but that's what we do, right? And coffee and chatting one with another. You've uh, come here to be drawn close to God in worship. I hope as you've been singing your praises that you sense the Holy Spirit and you felt drawn close to God. Uh, we drive some of us the uh, same route to church on Sundays, and we pull into the parking lot, and most of the time we pull into almost the same parking space every single time, and then we come in, and we park the back side of our lap in the same seat. Yeah. It's your seat. No one can sit in your seat. <laughs> it's your seat. You all have a seat. I know you do. And if you could have heard the voice of God this morning, to many of you, you may have heard him say, you're hot, you're getting close to a miracle. I want to do something in your life today. You're getting closer to what God wants to accomplish. Well, it's the holiday season. We've just finished Thanksgiving. What a great time. Hopefully you had. We, we certainly did. And Christmas is right around the corner. God wants to use us to be a miracle resource and provider for him and his kingdom, even during the holiday season. And I think God is saying to us today, you're getting hotter. You're getting, I'm about ready to do something through you Amen. to be a blessing Amen. to someone. How many want to be a blessing to someone Amen. else? I hope you do. I'm about ready to do something that is way beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. I have the ability to multiply whatever it is that you give to make it a blessing to other people. So let me break it down for you today, make it real simple, because I'm kind of simple. 
And I want you to write this down because I know you want to be part of something that's bigger than yourself. Most of us, we don't want to just go through life. We want to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. So here's how it works. I want you to write it down. You can fill in the blanks if, they're, if they are provided there for you in your study guide. When there is a need sensed by a few and each individual understands his responsibility and gives his all, regardless of the odds, then Jesus works a miracle. Let me read it for you again. In fact, why don't you read it with me aloud? When there is a need, sensed by a few, and each individual understands his or her responsibility and gives his all, regardless of the odds, then Jesus works a miracle. Even if it doesn't make sense. Some of the things that God's done in my life just don't make sense. I've got some questions for him someday. How many of you do too? Mm -hmm. Why did that happen? Or how come that was in that order? Why too soon? Or whatever your question is, I've got some for God. Some things just don't make sense the way God works, right? right. But that's how a biblical miracle works. In fact, here's the story. Let's read it from <laughs> Mark's gospel. I mentioned it's in all four of them, but let's read it from Mark beginning with the 6th chapter, verse 33. I'm reading from the Message Translation because it's real modern day in the way they tell the story. But many who saw them leaving recognized him. He's talking about the disciples. They had been following Jesus for these three years now, and so a lot of people kind of knew what they looked like. And they ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to McDonald's or Burger King and find themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, well, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, well, we find, found five loaves and we found two fishes amongst all these tens of thousands of people. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Broke it down. He was good at administration. He had the ability to manage things as well. So they sat down in that way and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. Thanksgiving is over. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Wow. What a miracle. So let's, let's look at the process of how a miracle takes place. Before I give you some of my ideas, let me ask you the question. If I asked you uh, what you would need in order for there to be a miracle in your life, what would you need? What would your answer be? Don't all speak at once, huh? Some would say faith. How many think that faith is important for a miracle? Yeah, we've got to trust and believe that I'm going to put my faith in you. Yes. Uh, the Bible says faith comes by hearing the hearing the word of God. And we need faith. The Bible says even if you have a little faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say that that happened to remove the cast into the seed. So we need, I agree with that. How many think we need a little faith for a miracle to take place? Sure. Yes, I, I think prayer is important. Yes. I think prayer is important. So we want a miracle to happen, and there's some components that I think that are essential for the Christian life. And uh, we know from the Bible that, that there are people, however, that received a miracle even though there was no faith at all. God sometimes just does things because he can and wants to, even though there's no faith involved in that miracle whatsoever. In fact, some of the miracles that he did, there was no faith seemingly involved, and the people were surprised when that miracle transpired. 
Well, you might say prayer, as I mentioned, and, and it's important, uh, I think, in order for us to experience a miracle. But I can show you places where there are miracles in the Bible where there was no prayer at all. So what does every miracle have in common? It begins with, number one, when there is a need. When there is no need for a miracle, <coughs> if there's no situation that needs a miracle, right? So a miracle happens, first of all, when there is a need. Every miracle begins with a problem. Now think about some of the situations you've been in, let alone what the Bible stories talk about. Uh, there was a problem first, so they needed God to work out that situation for them. Every miracle needs a problem. If there's not a problem, there's not a miracle. It begins with a need. It begins with a loss. <coughs> And it's amazing that you almost have to have something terrible happen to you in order for something wonderful to happen to you. Isn't that a paradox? Yes. How many have had something terrible happen to you? <laughs> Everybody. We need that terrible thing to happen in order for us to experience something wonderful. Yes. Every miracle yes. begins with a problem. Do you have a problem? Yes. Yes. Is that problem sitting next to you? No, don't answer that. <laughs> we all have problems. And I'm really encouraged by this because I face some mountains that are difficult to climb. I mean, you have had some obstacles in your way as well. Yeah. And I'm encouraged by that. It's encouraging to me because I have problems and I have challenges. I have needs. I, I have mountains, metaphorically, to climb. So, how many people right here, let me ask again, have at least one problem that you can think about today? You have at least one problem. Yes. Oh, yes. How many problems do you have, right? We all have problems, yeah? Here's what's incredible about this. Every miracle begins with a problem. Every miracle begins with a need. So that means if I have a problem, then I'm a candidate for a miracle. Amen. Amen. I love that truth. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a candidate. You're a candidate. You're a candidate for a miracle. You're a candidate. Because we all have problems. If you have a little problem, then you need a little miracle. If you have a big problem, then you need a big miracle. You're a candidate for a big, you're on the edge of receiving a miracle from God because you have a problem. I, I think we should close the service with an altar call where we ask people to come forward if you need prayer for something. And, and I think we should close the service with an altar call asking people to come forward who don't have a problem. <laughs> well, that won't be any good. <laughs> be because if you have no problem, you're not a candidate. Because you have a problem, you're a candidate for a miracle. Amen. In fact, if you have no problem, you have a problem. Because yes. 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 then you can't experience a miracle. That's right. So we could ask you to come forward at the close of the service, maybe, and pray for you, lay hands on you, and, and ask God, God, give them a problem. <laughs> I think they'd be a great way to close the service. No. Give them a problem. No. 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 We want a miracle. That's right. That's all right. When you have a problem, just understand what it means. It means you're getting hot. You're getting hot. You're on the verge of receiving a miracle from God. Amen. Getting close. So be encouraged. So it always begins with the need. And then secondly, sensed by a few is what that phrase said when we read it together. When there's a need, it's sensed by a few. Now in our text, uh, the disciples uh, they suddenly realized that it was getting late and the people hadn't eaten anything. And they're talking amongst themselves as Jesus is teaching the multitudes, the tens of thousands on the, on the hillside, this incredible lesson. And the disciples are kind of in a little huddle by themselves trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? Because 
these hordes of people haven't eaten and, and Pietro's pizza isn't nearby and there's no taco <laughs> time. I, what are we going to do? So the disciples huddle together and trying to figure out what to do. And, and they decide, well, Jesus is teaching the multitude on the hills. We've got to interrupt Jesus. I don't think I'd be, want to be one of those disciples. To interrupt. He's teaching them life lessons that are going to carry them throughout eternity. And they decide to interrupt Jesus. How would you like to be known as the one who interrupted Jesus? No. Probably change your name. The Great Interrupter. Or the Great in <laughs> Barnabas the Encourager. Judas the Betrayer. Lucy the Interrupter. No, we don't, we don't want to be known as the Interrupter. He was teaching this incredible <laughs> lesson. Jesus, Jesus, excuse me. Excuse me for a minute. We've got this problem. You know, as if he didn't know, right? It's getting late and the people are hungry. So don't miss this. When there is a need, sensed by a few. At least the disciples sensed that there was a problem that needed attention. And you only need a few. Uh, it doesn't have to be everybody. We wish it was everybody. But sometimes it's wherever two or three are gathered together in my name. Wherever two or three agree, agree together as touching any one thing, it shall be done according to God's right. And it only needs to be a few. Are you a candidate? You want to be one of those few that are getting hot, yeah. that can be used of God to be a blessing to other people, wherever two or three. You don't need to go out and get a vote on this. You don't have to have a majority to overwhelmingly say, yes, we've got this need. I think you're a candidate for a miracle. Jesus, the people are hungry. And we think you should dismiss the crowds. Send them away. Isn't it interesting how we think we have better ideas than God does? I think you should send them away. How many have ever tried to tell God what to do? <laughs> yes. Sure, all of us have done that. I think you should dismiss the, the, the crowd and let them go and buy a quarter pound of cheese. That's, that's what you should do. Just, just let them go. So Jesus turned around and he really messed them up. Because up to this point, all of the responsibility of taking care of the problem was on Jesus. And Jesus turned around and he said, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. As soon as he had said those words, I think they wished they had never mentioned the subject. What are we going to do? How are we going to figure this out? We don't have that kind of miracle working power. So when it comes to God doing miracles, we love to tell God what he needs to do. He's the big bellhop in the sky. Whatever I want you to do, you better do it for me or I'm going to get mad at you. And I'm not going to go to church for six months. I'm going to reject you. I'm going to turn my back. I'm going to stop giving my tithe. I'm not going to love you anymore. Sometimes when I'm praying, I tell God, I've got this, God, I've got this problem. And I know you're busy. I know, I know you're teaching the multitudes. So if you don't mind, since you're so busy, I, I'd like to, to give you some suggestions of ways you can answer my prayer. And we've got all these glorious ideas of how God should work on our behalf. How many have ever helped God in that way before? Come on, yeah, let's go back. God, maybe, maybe, maybe you aren't even aware of what's happening in my life right now. So I've just got a few ideas of what you can do to help me out in this situation. I just thought I'd help you. So we're giving these suggestions of how he can answer my prayer. God in heaven, he takes out his notebook okay, and he says, Hey, Bruce, that's a good idea. I don't want to forget that one, so let me write it down. I've never even thought of that before. <laughs> We're so concerned up here with how we're going to meet all these needs. If it weren't for you, Bruce, coming along and giving us these suggestions, we would never know what to do. What would we do without you? And sad to say, I've made thousands of suggestions to God of how he can answer my prayer. Maybe you have too. I think you should do this. I think you should give me that. I think you should heal here. I think you should direct me over there. 
I think you should tell that person to go jump on the lake. I think you should, you know, we got all these ideas, that things we think God should do, suggestions of how we should answer my prayers, but, but God doesn't want your suggestions. God doesn't want your suggestions. He, he doesn't even need your input. He's God. That's right. Yeah. He doesn't need me to interrupt him and tell him how to handle my problem. Write this down. When there's a need sensed by a few, and each individual understands his responsibility, that's number three. Understand your responsibility. This story is so interesting. I know you're enjoying it too, I can tell, because only three of you have fallen asleep so far. Some, no, 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 don't no. I, I'd rather have kids fall asleep in church than be at home somewhere. I would really Amen. love that. Amen, that's right. You know, it's those old yeah. geezers that fall asleep is the one I got in trouble with. No, I'm just kidding. Some of us do everything that we can to help God do what he's supposed to do. And what most of us really want is magic, not a miracle. Because a miracle... God wants to involve us. We just want him, you know, the way it is, wand over the situation and fix it. That's magic. I was in the airport coming home. By the way, did I tell you I got to bed at 2 o'clock after 2 o'clock this morning? Oh, I'm doing pretty good for going to bed at 2 o'clock. Yeah. But I saw this picture of Chris Angel in the airport. He was like, man, he really changed his look. Chris Angel, he would, you know, wave his hand and he yeah. would do magic. But, but God says, no, I want to use you. Right. I want to use you in the miracle. He wants partnership. Jesus, he's God. Yeah. He could have fed the 5,000. He could have said, all right, quail, fall from the sky. Yeah. All right, man, man. Wait a minute, he did that one time. Or 40 years ago. Yep, that's right. But... He wants to use us in the process. He wants a partnership. He wants that kid. He wants Jimmy's five loaves and two fish. Uh, yeah. He wants that money in your pocket yeah. from what you worked for this last month. Yeah. 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 He wants that softness of heart to reach out to a neighbor. He wants those words that you could speak that bring life to someone else. He wants to partner through you. You're getting hot. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, how many remember that? One of his best friends, Lazarus. Yep. What did he say? Could you guys go over there and remove the stone? Do you think he couldn't have moved the stone himself miraculously, supernaturally? But he wanted them to partner with him. You move the stone. Lazarus, come on out. <laughs> he wants to use you in the process. Lou, as you raise your hand back there, praise the Lord. Thank you for that response. Uh, he could feed the homeless in our city. Amen. But he uses the Lou Lacy's in life and help of Southern Nevada. Right. And oh. some of you to bring socks yes. and food and right. kindness yes. to the homeless. Yes. Sam and Rachel do it consistently, reach yes. out to the homeless of our city. Mm -hmm. He could do it without us, but he wants to partner with you to build those peanut butter sandwiches. Yes. Amen. Bring in the water. Mentioned the first recorded miracle earlier in the service where he turned water into wine and that marriage. Remember that story, some of you do. And what does he do? He could have waved his magic wand and suddenly everybody would have one. No. I want you to go, come on boys, go gather as many pots as you can find. Get those big clay, bring them in. And as long as you keep bringing those pots in filled with water, I can do something with it because he wants to partner with us. He could win your friends to Christ, but he wants to use your testimony, he wants to use your witness, he wants to use your friendship to win that person for Christ. He wants us to partner with him. One preacher said this, he said, without God, I cannot. How many are willing to admit that? Without God, I cannot. But without me, God will not. He wants to use us. When God does a miracle, you can write this down, what he wants more than anything else for us in faith is to participate with him. Be a partner with him. God wants to use you. It's a partnership. And, and I've got to be honest with you. If I was God, I probably wouldn't use people. I mean, sometimes people just irritate the heck out of me. 
They just hack me off sometimes. And they're lazy and whatever. How many of you just, sometimes I don't use that. Forget it, I'll do it myself. Yeah? Have you felt that way before? If I were God, I wouldn't use people because people are so human. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm a pretty good guy, but I, I wouldn't even use me. But you know what? I wouldn't use you either. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. If I was God, I'd just say, I'm going to do this all by myself. But he doesn't. He uses us. Yeah. Sensing yeah. that need. It's so humbling that, that God in his sovereignty values us so much that he wants to do a miracle through us. Isn't that encouraging? Yes, yes. He wants to work in us and through us and for us and include us. He includes us. He, he's waiting for you right now to have the sense of responsibility to say, I want to see God do great things and I'm willing to do my part, whatever that is. Yes, yes, I'll do my part. Uh, obviously, some of what I have to give God is very insignificant. What I have to give to God, to use, to participate in the miracle is not very much. How many of you are a fellow? What can one person do? I mean, I'm not that gifted. I don't have that much money. My personality is a little flat or whatever. Whatever it might be, I don't have much to offer God. Obviously, it's insignificant. But in doing my part, God will take it. And you 20,000 people you're going to feed with five loaves of bread and two fish? Kid, we don't need your mom here, your food. So insignificant. When there is a need, say it with me again, sensed by a few, and each individual understands his responsibility and gives his all, regardless of the odds. Number four, gives his all regardless of the odds. Here's where the miracle breaks down. We, we give all of our, give our all regardless of the odds. When Jesus said to the disciples, you give them something to eat, then they knew that they were already in trouble because what did they have? <laughs> Nothing. You feed them. You give them what you have. In fact, I told you the story I told in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John's Gospel says that they saw the need and they had already counted their money. Now remember that part of the story, Judas was the treasurer. He was the money keeper and they had the ledger book and they knew exactly how much money they had. They knew how many quarter pounds they could afford, how many, you know, fish and chips they could afford. They knew. And they knew they didn't have enough to feed that size of a crowd. So, so God wants us to be involved, but when he asked his disciples to feed the people, they saw that they didn't have enough. God wants to use you, but he uses you he wants you to recognize that you're in way over your head. There's no way in the world I'm going to be able to accomplish what you're asking me to do here. And that's a good place to be. Because then it's not about my personality. It's not about my gifts. It's not about my resources. I'm totally dependent upon God. Otherwise, I'm going to be a huge failure here. It's going to be a flop. I need you, God. I'm getting high. God wants to use you, but you're in over your head. The ask is simple, but it doesn't make sense. And so he said, figure it out, boys. Figure it out. They didn't have enough money. So they went to the crowd. Do you have any food? Do you have any food? Do you have any food? Do you have any food, have any food that we can use to kind of divide up and give everybody at least a little bit? Nobody planned ahead. The, now the disciples are getting closer and closer to where Jimmy and Johnny are camped out on the hillside. There's those two boys. And uh, Johnny's been watching, and he whispers in Jimmy's ear, hey, Jimmy, they're looking for food, dude. They're looking for food. And nobody's got any except for you. Jimmy could have sat on his lunch, right? I mean, a squished lunch is better than no lunch at all, right? <laughs> he could have hid it from the disciples. If I had been Jimmy, I probably would have done that. But there are at least two reasons why Jimmy would have been tempted not to give Jesus his lunch. Number one, he had enough to take care of himself. I'm smart enough, smart enough to bring lunch for myself. Bring your own lunch. 
June fall. Go ahead and start with that. I brought lunch for me. But I found this to be true. You might want to write this down. You don't have to. It's hard to take care of others when you're comfortable yourself. Why is it that we've got so much? We're so comfortable with all the food we could ever hope for, great jobs and all that. We have a hard time taking care of others. But then I found people who have absolutely nothing, can't even rub two pennies together, and they're the ones who are the most generous of all. That's right. A widow, she gave her offering, and she just had a little mite to put in the offering. Jesus said she did more than anyone else. It's not based on proportion or ratio. It's the heart she gave her all. Jimmy, if you'll give these five loaves and two fishes to Jesus, then he'll feed 5,000 people. <laughs> over there, over there. What in the world? What are these guys smoking anyway? <laughs> there's no way. There's no way they're going to be able to feed all these people. It didn't make any sense. Right, right. A lot of the things that God was doing in life doesn't make sense in the natural. Because right. He's a supernatural God. Yeah. He's a miracle working God. But He wants to work through what you bring to Him. Yes. What you have to offer. Yes. Even though it may not be all that much. Right. Jimmy couldn't figure it out. Didn't understand. By the way, my gift seems so small. Compared to the needs of everyone around me. Don't let the devil. Don't let the evil one cheat you out of being part of a miracle yes. by saying, I don't have much to offer. No. Offer what you have. Yes. Little is much when God is in it. I've heard that saying a zillion times too. In your hands, that lunch will not only feed you, Jimmy, but it'll fill you up for hours. But in God's hands, it can feed all of these people. It depends upon whose hands it's in. If it stays in your hands, yeah, you'll eat lunch, you'll, you'll be satisfied, you'll be full, everybody else will be starving. Mm -hmm. But if you give it to God in His hands, Multiplies. in God's hand, the miracle happens. You can write this down when the lunch exchanges hands. Give it to God. Give your resources to God. Give your gifts to God. Give your abilities to God. Hallelujah. Give it to God. And that's what He did. He gave up His lunch. And you know the story. There was 5,000 fed, and there was fish and, fish and chips left over. <laughs> Baskets full left over. So number five, Jesus works that miracle. And I'm glad for the miracle working power of God. And that right. same God is alive today, and he wants to do a miracle in and through you as well. Can you imagine what happens after this gospel story? Everyone's been fed, and they're all hearing about what Jesus had done. He, he, he's teaching on the hillside, and they don't have anything to eat, and he has his lunch brought to him, and the miracle happens, and the whole crowd eats, and there was leftovers, and they're walking off the hill. They're going back to the surrounding villages and towns, back to their homes, and some of them run into Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, thanks for sharing your lunch. Hey, Jimmy, thanks for being used of God to, to bless all of us. Thanks, thanks for your lunch. Did you see how Jesus took a few fishes and loaves? And, well, thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Jimmy. How many want to be a part of a miracle? Yes. Thank you for giving your life. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for going. Thank you for speaking. So Jimmy and Johnny, they go back to their homes and Jimmy goes to the house where his mom's there busy doing dishes. Hey, Jimmy, I'm glad that you're home. How was everything today? Mom, I gotta tell you, come in here and sit down, I gotta tell you what happened. She comes into the room and says, uh, well, before you tell me about your day, I, I gotta make this confession to you. I'm, I feel a little bit badly because, you know, before you took off for the day, I made this lunch for you, and then I found out later that Johnny was going with you. I should've made enough lunch for both of you. And I really feel bad about it. When I packed that lunch today, I, I didn't know Johnny was going. I should have packed some. I thought about it all day long. I hope you had enough to eat. <laughs> hope you had enough to eat. Mom, you're not going to believe this. I had enough to eat. That lunch that you gave me today, 
everybody else didn't have any food and, and Jesus asked for it and it didn't make sense to me. But, you know, I, I gave it to him and there was something inside of me that just said, why don't you just give it to Jesus? There's something inside you today, right now. I believe God's speaking to you up to some of you saying, why don't you just give it to Jesus? Amen. Trust him. Well, I did. I gave it to him, Mom, and, uh -huh. and he fed over 5,000 people. Jimmy, you're lying to me again. <laughs> Honey, you got this problem. I think you need to go see a counselor because you, you're just always stretching the truth. And no, I promise you, Mom, go ask Johnny. He was there. He saw it, too. He'll verify my story. Jimmy never got away from that day that God used him to do a miracle. And neither will you and me. We'll never be able to escape. God used me to help that person. God used me to be a blessing in that family's life. It's the holiday season. There's people that you could bless. Amen. Oh, it's too much trouble putting a shoebox together. Come on. We can put a shoebox together. The timing's done, but there's other things you can do, right? That's right. And there's next year. That's right. He took what he had and he gave. What do you think what would happen if we put shoe boxes together every week until Christmas? How many boxes would we have ready to get sent away? So he took what he had and he gave it to Jesus, and all of a sudden miracles start to happen. And then you know, he grows up later on, he gets married, he has kids of his own, and bedtime stories. He, he lay down in the bed. Beside his kids, he began to tell them stories. And he said, hey, kids, maybe you haven't heard about the time. When, oh, no, here comes the fish and chip story again. <laughs> <laughs> when you give your fish and chips to Jesus, he takes it, he blesses it, he multiplies it, and he gives it to other people. And Jimmy's life will be forever changed, impacts not only that community, but impacts his family, his kids, his wife. That's what I want for all of us. But we need his help, don't we? Oh, yeah. I need him to help me, but I've got to do my part. I, I, I kind of want him to help me without me doing my part. Mm -hmm. Don't we all? <laughs> but he wants you to partner with him and do what you can. This is not a, a tithing and an offering sermon, but it certainly includes that. Can't, can't. I mean, maybe you don't make that much money, but all compiled together takes care of the needs of God's house, right? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to help uh, him to help me without having to speak to my coworkers. I, I kind of want him to help me with, without me giving in an offering. I just want to stay right here and pray for provision. Mm -hmm. I just want to pray for my friends. No, he wants you to go to your friends. He wants you to be nice to them. He wants you to be kind to them. He wants you to show the love of Christ to them. Right. He wants to use you. Well, we just want God bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Yes. Bless them. <laughs> bless them. No, bless them through me. Bless them through me. Use me. God says you gotta go. You gotta give. You gotta care. Go to where they're at. Might be your neighbor. It might be your uh, aggressor. I don't know who it is in your life, but we gotta go. We gotta offer them our lunch, yeah? yeah. And then watch. Because God does a miracle to our little attempts yes. to be a blessing yes. to someone else. You can write this down in closing. Obedience is never understood on the front end. It's only understood on the back end. Why are you asking me to do this, God? It's so uncomfortable for me to talk to that coworker about Jesus. It's uncomfortable at best. In fact, it's kind of scary. But when you see the other end of the story, how God maybe used you to influence someone for Jesus' sake, the blessing comes. How many want to be used by God? Amen. How many want to be used to see a miracle? Amen. Yes. Transform someone else's life. So let's pray and ask Him to help us do that then, right? As we close. Would you pray with me? God, we give you our lives today. 
We surrender to you. God, we're willing to give you our meager gifts and abilities. Our lunch, we're willing to give that to you. If somehow in your hands you could multiply it and use it to transform someone else's life, to change them, to somehow through our kindness and love draw them closer to God. And, and as we give our gifts to you, our simple prayer is, God, take it and use it. Take it and use it. And we know that you are in the miracle working business and you can accomplish much. As I'm willing just to yield and partner and be used to God. Give us that opportunity, maybe even this week. When someone crosses our path where it would be easy to eat our lunch. I don't mean just a lunch, but it certainly could include a lunch person behind me, how about if I pay for their Starbucks instead of just paying for my Starbucks? Something I can do to just show some kindness and some love and consideration to someone else. Maybe you could use us to perform a miracle in that person's life too. What, what a humbling and exciting opportunity that could be for each of us as we're willing to go and be God's hands extended to someone else wherever our feet would take us this week. That's our desire. So God, we give our lives to you to accomplish your purposes. We pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many got something out of this message? Yes. I think I'm going to take a man. <laughs> got something out of it. God's good. He speaks to us every time if we're willing to listen. His word never returns void, right? That's right. So it's one thing to hear God's word. We all heard it today. I know it was, you know, maybe not the best vessel. A lot of great creatures out there. But, but if we then will be willing to apply what we've heard, that's where the real yes, difference that's takes right. place. Yeah. That's right. So God help us as we go our way. In yes. Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. 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 Good to see you today.